We are talking to Mr. Larry Wilson, CEO of Safe Start International. Good afternoon, Mr. Larry. Hey, how are you? Hi. Larry, this is regarding the questions on, uh, there is always a fight of safety, waste production. How do you take this, how do you counter this particular well, situation? I think for years and years, there's sort of almost been a, this belief that safety is counter to production. And I, if, you, you know, if you have to put a guard on a rotating sprocket, it costs money, it doesn't make the machine run any faster, so it seems almost natural for a lot of supervisors, managers, and even safety professionals to think that safety costs money or that taking extra safety precautions slows the job down so the idea is that you know safety versus production but nobody is ever trying to get hurt so it isn't just about the hazards it's also about the human error or if you will contacting the hazard or having the hazardous energy contact you so if you start to focus more on human error, then what you'll realize is that many of your production errors, a lot of the unscheduled downtime, a lot of the quality problems are also caused by human error. You ship 150 skids, three truckloads, to your best customer instead of your second best customer who actually ordered them. Nobody got hurt but it's a mistake that costs you a lot of money. So when you start shifting your perspective or your paradigm from solely being focused on the hazards to realizing that it's hazards and human error that are required for an injury, you can also start to improve production, you can start to improve quality or reliability, you can improve customer relations inside or outside customers. And if you're moving or things are moving around you, you will also improve safety. People think management is not concerned about safety. Is it true, Larry? Well, I've heard this for years and years. I wouldn't want to say how many in my career, 30 plus, that it's because management doesn't care enough. So let me ask you a direct question. When you got hurt a lot, and you got hurt a lot just like I did when you were a little kid, do you really think it's because your mom and dad didn't love you? I mean, I, my mom and dad are still alive. I know they still love me, but they couldn't keep me from getting hurt when I was more than arm's length away. And when you hand your car keys to your teenage son or your teenage daughter, you can't do the driving for them either. So it's important that management is certainly looking after the facility, that there's good process safety systems in place, that they're providing guards, engineering, and personal protective equipment to the people. But that alone is not going to be enough to keep the people from getting hurt. What you also have to do is give people the habits, the safety-related habits, and the skills like self-triggering, so that they can keep themselves from getting hurt in the moment. And I've heard so many times that it's, it's always about these, these bad managers. And when I first started out in this business, I was, you know, I was looking for these bad, you know, where are these evil supervisors? Where, where are these evil managers? And I, I mean, I met a few supervisors who were a little too pushy for sure. But I didn't really meet any evil people at all. They were all good people. None of them ever wanted any of their employees to get hurt. But like, just like your parents, they can't do the looking or the thinking for the employees when they're moving or things are moving around them. That's only something that we can all do for ourselves. It's something we can try to teach our children, and it's something we can try to teach our employees. But it isn't because we're bad parents, and it isn't because they're bad managers. How do you perceive the challenges for the employees to get trained in uh, workplace safety? One of the questions I get asked, or 
I guess almost one of the complaints that you hear from a lot of safety professionals is that they're, they have difficulty or trouble trying to get their workers engaged in their workplace safety program. There are a number of reasons for this. Um, one of them is that the training you provide is just boring. It's the same old, same old thing. They've heard it before. So, you know, it's like trying to watch the same movie 20 times in a row. After a while, it's pretty hard to pay attention. Um, when they sense that the people aren't paying attention, a lot of safety professionals make their lives even more difficult by getting louder and meaner instead of realizing that the message that they're giving isn't new and they're saying the same old things. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Nobody is ever trying to get seriously hurt. We know that for sure. So if you think about why people get hurt, why do you get hurt? You know, standing up, banging your head, burning your hand or arm in the kitchen. It's because you weren't paying attention in the moment. So if we give workers a, a different perspective, something that's actually useful, that will help them both on and off the job, then they will start to listen. And that's another problem that safety professionals and a lot of managers don't consider, and that is there is way more risk of getting seriously hurt or killed off the job than there is on the job, but we don't talk about that. We talk only about the workplace. But we say we care about your safety. Well, if you really care about my safety, you'd care about me 24-7. So let me just ask you all one simple question. Do you really care where you die? Or do you just not want it to be today and hopefully not tomorrow? I don't know about you, I'm not that fussy about where I die. I just would prefer it wasn't today, and I certainly hope it's not tomorrow either. So if we engage the workers and give them something useful that will help them and their families, not just on the job, but off the job where the real risk is, then they do start to listen. Then they do start to get engaged. They do start to participate, and they start to actually bring ideas and improvement solutions forward to you. People blame other people, malfunctioning equipments, after the injury. What is the real scene? I mean, do you really agree with this? Quite often after an injury or an incident or, or even a, a, a car collision, car wreck out there on the motorway, it is very common for people to try to diminish or deflect their own responsibility in this incident. But that's partially because they don't want to tell the police officer that they fell asleep when they were driving or that they made another kind of mistake. Because quite often when you admit that it was your fault or that it was your mistake, you end up in more trouble. So we've all kind of learned how to say it was the equipment, it was the windshield wipers, it was the bright lights in my eye, it was the other guy, or it was a dap a cow, a deer, a dog, a kangaroo, I've even heard alligator and crocodile. But think about it. What's really happened to you? How many times have you been hurt because the equipment broke, failed, or malfunctioned? How many traffic lights have actually worked incorrectly that caused one of your car accidents? Or close calls? So everybody knows that nobody is planning to get seriously hurt. We know that something unexpected must have happened. But essentially, there's only three sources of unexpected events. Either you do something unexpectedly, somebody else does something unexpectedly, or the equipment breaks or malfunctions and it does something unexpectedly. And if you really look at what has happened to you on and off the job, because I know you were never trying to get hurt anywhere, how many times have you been hurt because the equipment broke, failed, or malfunctioned? How many times have you been hurt, not including contact sports, where the other guy might intentionally be trying to hurt you? How many times have you been hurt because the other guy did something unexpectedly? And I think what you'll see, and what people all around the world have seen, 
is that over 95% of the time, the unexpected thing was in the self area. Now, what unexpected things happen in the self area? Human error. You're never trying to make a mistake, so by definition, it's always unexpected. Larry, what about the risk assessment uh, really sometimes fails while preventing errors that cause injuries? Do you buy this particular... Uh... Risk assessment, certainly, when you're considering physical hazards, um, you know, the condition of the equipment, the safeguards, you know, are there any there? Um, do we have, for instance, emergency preparedness on this job site if something does go wrong? All of those things are very, are very good. But very few risk assessments actually take into account human factors like rushing, frustration, fatigue, and complacency that can cause critical errors, like eyes not on task, mind not on task, moving into or being in the line of fire, or somehow losing your balance, traction, or grip. So, yes, if you've got an untrained crew, you don't have all of the proper equipment or the, condi the equipment is in good order, like it, you know, it's old, it's fallen apart, those kinds of risk assessments are very useful for the very basic stuff. But if you've got a well-trained crew and there's nothing wrong with the equipment, you can still have serious injuries and in some cases fatalities if people aren't paying attention in the moment. So, your risk assessment, in order for it to be really helpful or productive, needs to include human factors like rushing, frustration, fatigue, and complacency, and it needs to include the potential for critical errors. Eyes not on task, mind not on task, moving into or being in the line of fire, or somehow losing your balance, traction, or grip. Otherwise, if your risk assessment does not include what causes human error and it doesn't include the potential consequences of human error, you may also be dealing with an accident incident investigation for a serious injury or a fatality. Larry, what are the latest uh, error reduction techniques uh, you suggest to the industry? Well. To try to explain all of the critical error reduction techniques very quickly might not be super helpful, but let me, let me just give you a, a quick idea, okay? Rushing, frustration, and fatigue are states, human factors, that you can feel in the moment. You can tell when you're in a rush, you can tell when you're frustrated, and you can tell when you're tired. So as soon as you realize you're rushing, you're frustrated, or you're tired, you must quickly think, eyes on task, mind on task, line of fire, balance, traction, grip. But it has to happen quickly. And so what we need to do is we actually need to train your subconscious mind. Because your conscious mind is going to be thinking about why you're rushing or what's going to happen if you're late, who or what is making you frustrated, or when you can get some rest or maybe even some sleep. So. Training your subconscious mind is a bit like walking over the grass. If one or two people walk over the grass, nothing happens. 30 or 40 people walk over it, you get the beginning of a path. 400 or 500 people walk over it, now the path gets wider and faster. And everybody understands this with music. You don't play a musical instrument in a while, pretty soon you're not going to be able to remember the notes. You don't speak a foreign language for a while, you struggle finding the words. And in a sport, if you don't practice the sport regularly, you might be a scratch golfer, you know, be able to shoot at par. But if you haven't played golf in five years, my guess is you're not going to be shooting par that day. So everybody understands it with music, with a foreign language, or with sports. But when it comes to safety training or training people on critical error reduction techniques. A lot of people also have this paradigm about, you know, just getting the tick mark in the box. Okay, lockout, tagout. Yeah, we did that. Confined space entry. Yeah, we did that. Hazard communication, hazardous chemicals. Yeah, we did that. And they try to get it done as quickly and as cheaply as possible. So, 
quite often I'll say to them, are you doing safety training or are you doing liability training to make your lawyers happy? But when it comes to training your subconscious, there aren't any shortcuts. It's about a lot of repetition, hearing a lot of stories, grooving those neural pathways so that when you're in a rush, when you're frustrated or you're tired, it gives you that that feeling of, of being exposed. Now, when you watch a movie, you know something bad is going to happen because the music changes. But in the real world, there is no music. So, we've got to actually train their subconscious so that they hear that danger music in their head whenever they're rushing, whenever they're frustrated, or whenever they're tired. Now, there's three other critical error reduction techniques but it would probably take me the better part of an hour to explain all of them. So, um, if you'd like to learn a little bit more, suggest maybe, you know, you get a copy of the book. Or, um, if you'd like, get yourself out to a Safe Start workshop and you can find out about it in depth. According to you, what are the best ways to engage worker to prevent errors that causes injuries? The best way to engage workers is to talk about what they really care about or what they're really worried about. We all got hurt a lot when we were little, usually 10 to 20 times a week. We were bumping into things, bangs, bruises, cuts. You go to the store, you'll see it says family pack for the big size of band-aids. There isn't, like, single young man's pack. I mean, you might be able to buy a little thing with five band-aids in it. But there's a reason that that says family pack, and that's because the little kids get hurt a lot, okay? But we get hurt 10 to 20 times a week when we're little kids. We get hurt 10 to 20 times a year as adults. From 20 a week to 20 a year is a 5,000% improvement. So... No wonder all adults think they're safe enough already. We come to that perspective fairly honestly, if you will. So, if you want people to put a bit of effort into improving, they're going to have to be motivated, or why bother? So we need to find out, well, what does really motivate them? And what does really motivate them is their family. But it isn't so much about you going home safe to your family. That's important, yes. It's much more about your family safety. So I just usually ask the people at the safety conferences, just give me an honest answer. What do you really care more about? Your safety or your family safety? And everybody puts their hands up for their family safety. So when we give them tools and techniques that will actually help their family prevent critical errors, now they're a lot more willing to take this stuff home. They're a lot more willing to learn it, to learn it well enough so they can actually teach their children. And as most of you know, when you actually have to turn around and teach something to somebody else, that's the highest form of retention. So a lot of safety people know the family's important, and if you will, they try to play the family card. But they're not playing it the right way. They're playing it like, we want you to go home safe to your family instead of, we want you to go home and teach your family how to be safe. Larry, what are the best safety practices as per your opinion and why still don't people adopt those? One of the things that's obviously very frustrating for supervisors, managers and safety professionals is that when they provide good pieces of personal protective equipment, they have good engineering, good controls, guards, and the people aren't using the procedures, they're not using the guard, or they don't put the guards back on, or they're not wearing the pieces of personal protective equipment that they're providing that the company paid for. It can be very frustrating, and they can sort of think it's because of the worker's attitude, and it, it becomes, if you will, personal, okay? Instead of perhaps looking at, well, how complacent would somebody have to have become to not wear the piece of personal protective equipment? 
I mean, even if it wasn't comfortable, if you knew you were going to get hit on the head, you'd wear a hard hat. If you knew that you were going to get a sharp piece of metal in your eye, you'd wear the safety glasses whether they look cool or whether they didn't look cool. And if you knew you were going to drop something on your toe and crush your toe, you'd wear the steel-toed work boots whether you liked them or whether you didn't. So instead of looking at the worker and whether the worker has a bad attitude, we would be much better off to look at the level of complacency that has developed within that worker and start to work on the complacency instead of the person's personality. So, one of the best ways to do this is to talk to the worker about the close calls, the serious close calls that he or she has seen or experienced and then get them to think about those close calls in terms of how could those have been worse. I mean, maybe you've been working at this grinding wheel without a face shield for 20 years and you've never been hurt. But what about that time when the tool bit broke and it embedded itself into the wall? What if it had to hit you here? What if it had to take your teeth out? What if it had to hit you here and kill you? That'll start to affect their level of complacency. The other thing we need to do is we need to get the people and the supervisors and the managers to understand that we are all creatures of habit. So if you start to do something often enough, like wearing a seat belt on a fork truck, it's actually going to feel uncomfortable if you don't have the seat belt on, because that's what your subconscious is used to. So we actually have to get the people to adopt the new behavior until it becomes their new habit. And then they'll actually feel more comfortable with the safety glasses on than without them. So it does take a bit of work on the part of the supervision and the managers to make sure that people do this often enough so that they get the habit working for them. But it's also very important that they realize that very few people are actually bad workers. Nobody actually wants to get seriously hurt. So instead of looking at the person's personality, look at the level of complacency that has developed within that person and work on the complacency to bring that down. Don't try to talk to the person about what's wrong with you and why you have a bad attitude you'll be much more successful working on the complacency than trying to change the person's personality. Yeah, Larry, this was regarding the last question about safety training. Many people think safety training is the main problem when it comes to workplace injuries. But older, very experienced workers get seriously hurt and killed frequently. Why? When you first start out doing something and you don't know how to do it all that well, it's easy to make mistakes and depending on what's moving or your movement. When it comes to safety training, at the very beginning when somebody doesn't know what they're doing, obviously they need to be trained, they need to learn, okay? Um, and if they don't get proper safety training and they, aren't, they have no idea what it is they're actually supposed to do, well, obviously that can lead to injuries, right? But that's only at the beginning when you're learning the job. After you've done the job for 5, 10, 15 years, just like driving your car, you can still make mistakes. But it isn't because you don't know what you're doing. It's most likely because of rushing, frustration, fatigue, complacency, or a combination of those states. But because most safety professionals don't understand critical error reduction techniques, let alone have the ability to teach their employees critical error reduction techniques, they go back to what they did when the people were learning, which is, well, we need to retrain the worker. If somebody slips and falls on a stairway, and you look at the accident incident investigation for that last column where it says action taken to prevent recurrence. Quite often you will read things that say 
re-instructed worker on policies for ascending and descending stairways and ladders. Really, if you had to walk up the stairs to get to the training room, I can see why that training wouldn't be very effective, and I'm sure you can as well too. We all know how to walk up and down stairs, and we all know we're supposed to hold the handrail. But sometimes if you're in a rush and your phone rings and you try to pull it out while you're running down the stairs, you miss your step and you fall down. So, retraining somebody who's been working at a machine for 37 years, the guy that teaches everybody else how to work that machine, and then Freddie loses his finger, and then you look at the accident investigation and it says, re-indoctrinated Freddie. I mean, really. What we've got to do is we've got to look beyond what happens to somebody in their first few months on the job. Yes, if we didn't train them properly at the beginning, that could easily cause injuries. But once we know what we're doing, retraining people is not the answer, but it will certainly make people very, very bitter and annoyed because you didn't really give them anything that will help prevent the next one. So we've got to learn how to teach people critical error reduction techniques. And when there is an incident or an injury, we've also got to look at, well, you know, did you use those critical error reduction techniques in the moment? And then maybe a little more help on the critical error reduction techniques that could have prevented this injury and could prevent the next one instead of going over the same old basic stuff that they've known for years and years. Lastly, Larry, what is really important, removing workplace hazards or reducing human errors? When I get asked the question, what's more important, hazards or human error, I usually like to ask the people, how many hazards are there in the world that you negotiate every day with your eyes and mind alone? You'd have to count every car, every truck, every two-wheeler, every pedestrian. You'd have to count every curb that you have to walk up and down, every crack in the sidewalk, every door you could pinch your finger on. But you don't get hurt every day. You hardly get hurt at all. So the hazards, if you think about them in this world, like gravity, are everywhere and they're constant. But when we're not paying attention, when we have our eyes and our mind not on task at exactly the same time, then we don't see it or we don't see it coming and in that moment we're defenseless. So it's not that we're totally defenseless, it's that from time to time we are momentarily defenseless and if you don't mind I'd just like to give a plug for my new book because that's what it's called, Defenseless Moments, A Different Perspective on Serious Injuries and Fatalities, or if you will, defenseless moments, what really causes the majority of serious injuries and fatalities, and that's both on and off the job and on the motorway. Thank you, Mr. Larry, for your valuable time and giving fantastic inputs on human safety. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. My pleasure.